Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and can I welcome our panellists to this second half of the committee's inquiry into the Gender Recognition Act. I'd like to welcome Rosa Friedman, Kathleen Stock, sorry, your names are really tiny on this screen, and Alex, is it Sullivan? I can't read that, My, that's age, uh, as opposed to anything else. Um, can I thank you for coming along this afternoon and contributing? Hopefully you will have heard the evidence given by our first panellists, and I'm going to go straight over to Sarah Brickcliffe, who's going to start with the first section of questions. Questions to Kathleen and Rosa, and this is prior to the government's response on the GRA consultation. What were some of the concerns you had about changes to the GRA legislation, especially regarding self identification and access to single sex spaces? So, Kathleen, could I come to you first, if possible, please? Yes, so. Um my thoughts about changing the fundamental basis of the Gender Recognition Act, which was initially, if you look back at Hansard, was thought to be a way of um, granting privacy to transsexual people who had, it was assumed would have had extensive medical intervention so that they would look very much like the opposite sex and therefore it would be a reasonable worry about their privacy should they be um, their sex be revealed and it was also about um, allowing same-sex marriage in certain contexts prior to later legislation. Um, I, my worry, and also I think it was also assumed that this legal fiction that you could change sex which was introduced through that legislation was therapeutic um, for people that had gender dysphoria and for whom it would be distressing to hear um, to be confronted with the facts about their sex. Now, if we're moving to self-ID, it seems to me that we've fundamentally taken away all of that rationale because there's no longer any real worries about privacy if somebody hasn't had medical intervention. Um, sex is pretty obvious. And if gender dysphoria is no longer a requirement on getting this um, certificate, then uh, then there's no therapeutic aspect. So um, I just think that is one That is one worry I have. Another set of worries I have are about the practical interactions with the Equality Act, but I think fundamentally it would have lost its rationale. Thank you. Kathleen, can I come to Rosa, please? Thank you. I think the key concerns that women raised around self-ID were um, the fact that the policy being proposed did not uphold the single sex exemptions in the Equality Act. There was no proposal as to how the two would work together. And this would then allow um, people to self-ID and access women's spaces. Now, as Professor Sharp talked about, uh, there are times when, when you can't have single sex spaces, but there are times when it is proportionate and legitimate to do so, particularly around women's refuges, around prisons, especially around male violence against women. And we do know from the stats that there is no difference in terms of offending rates between trans women and, um, and men, um, that male violence against women remains the same across both populations. So that was a key concern, but the second concern for me was the lack of legal definitions. In other countries where there are self-ID regimes, there are usually very strong um, sets of laws and definitions that explain how self-ID, how gender identity, how transgenderism, whatever terms you want to use, um, operate alongside sex. Um, so in Ireland, there is this um, self-declaration scheme. At the same time, institutions, whether they're schools or prisons or any other institutions, are able to decide whether they will remain sex segregated or whether they will be gender identity segregated. Um, what we had in the proposals over here was very much, let's allow self-ID, but not think through how this would operate in practice. Thank you, Rosa. And Alice, I just saw your hand up there. Would you like to just come in on that? Yeah, so I was, um, I mean, obviously fully respect the right of trans people to live their lives and express themselves as they wish. So what really worried me was the sweeping nature of the proposed reform and what seemed to be a sort of absolutist demand really for self-ID across the board without any gatekeeping across a whole range of domains where it seems to me that sex does matter. So one of the first things that worried me was um, women's sports categories, for example, and um, changing rooms. I was also very much struck by, um, in the context of proposed, what seemed to me quite sweeping legislative change, um, the, the difficulty of having any conversation about it. So one of the first things I heard about 
was um, the attack on Maria McLachlan, a 60-year-old activist who was just trying to attend a meeting on this proposed legislative reform, and she was assaulted by a young trans activist. That was the impetus for A Woman's Place UK being formed. And of course, since then, all of the meetings that Women's Place have tried to hold to discuss this legislative um, change and related issues have been attacked by people trying to shut those meetings down. So that seemed to me fundamentally um, you know, really strange and not something I've ever been aware of in any other proposed legislative reform. Thank you, Alice. Um, again, this is to Catherine and Rosa, but if you do want to come in, that's fine. Some of the written ev evidence that we received argues that some women are scared to speak out about concerns they have over single-sex spaces. Um, why do you think that is? Rosa, can I come to you first on this, please? I think that outside of academia, um, <clears throat> where we do have protection in terms of academic freedom and speech, um, women have had their jobs threatened, uh, women have um, been physically attacked, they have been physically threatened, there have been violent threats on the internet, but also in person. And I think women are scared to speak out because women have been raised throughout history uh, with male violence against women. And um, when that violence is being perpetrated, um, towards women who speak out and often being perpetrated not by trans individuals but by their allies who often are straight um, heterosexual men who, who contain the most privilege in our societies. Um, I think that there are those concerns. I think also women, the women I know, the women I've spoken to across the last three years have great, a great deal of compassion for the suffering and distress that comes with gender dysphoria and for the intrusions into privacy that trans individuals have to go through in order to acquire a GRC. Um, women will voice their concerns around the sex-based right, but will also be compassionate towards trans individuals and recognise their legitimate needs and their political interests, whereas trans individuals, or particularly their allies, refuse to recognise the legitimate needs and political interests of women as a class. And that has really silenced women, because whenever women speak out, we are told we are transphobic, rather than there being any recognition that we have our own needs and concerns. Thank you. Rosa, Kathleen, could, could I bring you in on that, please? Yes, um, I would also like to add to what Rosa has said there, which I agree with, that what hasn't helped, I think, is HR policies in um, many organisations which state that, um, well, they have a very expansive definition of transphobia, which they would class as a kind of bullying and harassment, and they usually adopt, because they are uh, Stonewall Diversity Champions, which is a branding scheme that Stonewall runs for companies, um, they usually adopt Stonewall's definition of transphobia, which includes the words something like fear or dislike of trans people, including denying their gender identity or refusing to accept it. Now, that's you know can be read in different ways, but one natural way to read that is if you think that sex is more important than gender identity and across a range of domains and you want to say so, you run the risk of looking transphobic. And that isn't helped by... Um, media organisations like the BBC and The Guardian, who are also Stonewall Diversity Champions as it happens, uh, inevitably posing views like Rosa, Alice's and mine as either transphobic or now they have moved back a step to anti-trans. And that is just completely not true and, and sets up this opposition that the only possible reason that people like us could be saying what we're saying is that we must have some problem with trans people or think that they are particularly predatory. And it's not that at all. Most women I know are concerned about male patterns of violence and male patterns of sexism, and they want to be able to retain the vocabulary to describe those patterns where they see them. But that doesn't mean we're anti-trans. Thank you, Kathleen. Alice, would you like to come in there? Yeah, I think what's really unique about this is that you've got organisations um, who promote the gender identity point of view, like Stonewall, who actually explicitly have a slogan and hashtag, no debate. So they're actually calling explicitly for no debate and, and to shut the conversation down. And that's been absolutely um, vicious. And I'm, I've got personal experience of this. I know, I know that both Rosa and Kathleen have personal experience of it too, but if you don't mind me um, telling you my experience, um, I was deplatformed from a, a research method seminar, believe it or not, um, and the reason for that was that as a quantitative social scientist, I believe that we should collect data on sex, that it's an important demographic variable. And I organised a letter to the census authorities 
uh, raising some concerns about their proposed guidance, um, allowing people to answer the sex question according to identity instead of um, their sex. And as a direct result of that, a, a, a seminar on data collection on sex and gender, which I had been due to speak at at the National Center for Social Research, was cancelled um, rather than having me to speak. And um, I was told that um, uh, my views would have literally made audience members unsafe. Now, that was a, a seminar where um, some of the speakers would have been from the Office of National Statistics, and some of them would have been from NatSEN, and one of those was um, Nancy Kelly, who was at NatSEN at that time, and is now, of course, CEO of Stonewall. So my view that sex is a fundamental demographic variable and we should collect data on it is, is so mainstream within social science. It's really hard to believe how it could literally make people feel unsafe. So it was really deeply shocking to be vilified in that way and to be um, denied the opportunity to engage in a, in a normal, respectful discussion. But of course, other people have been through far worse on this. There are so many examples. I won't try to cover it all. I'm very happy to send more information in writing. But um, one case, for example, is the historian Selena Todd at Oxford, who has to be accompanied to her lectures by security guards because the university has received credible threats. Now, she said nothing offensive, unless you think that discussing women's rights is offensive. Even more disturbing, perhaps, are the attempts to, to shut down research and to stop research from being published. For example, um, Lisa Lippmann's research on the surge in girls presenting with gender dysphoria in the current generation. Um, Michelle Moore is another example, a disability scholar who's raised questions about the prevalence of gender transitioning among autistic girls and has faced a campaign of harassment. But the, the results of this go way beyond academia. Obviously, this is, this is painful for the academics involved, but there are serious human consequences to the wider chilling effect. You will, I'm sure, be aware of the case of Kira Bell, a young woman who uh, has just brought a successful case against the Tavistock because she regrets the medical treatment that she received and feels she was poorly advised. And the judges in that case highlighted the lack of data and evidence on youth transition um, and, and the fact that the Tavistock failed to collect some really obvious um, data, including um, the number of autistic girls that they were seeing. This goes way beyond academia, and I just want to name a few examples of um, people who've been targeted by gender activists. Um, Maya Forstater, Alison Bailey, Sonia Appleby, and Raquel Rosario Sanchez are all women of colour who've been targeted, and I hope the committee might have the opportunity to hear some of those diverse um, voices in future sessions. Thank you, Alice. Um, and it's been argued that reforms to the GRA would have no impact on women's spaces because Section 7 of the Equality Act means trans women are legally able to access women-only spaces already. What is your view on how the GRA and Equality Act interact in that regard? Rosa, can I bring you in? Um, what, we, what we don't have at the moment is any clarity on that, uh, whether it's from judges or from policymakers. Um, they've shied away from discussing, first of all, most importantly, within the um, Equality Act, when the sex-based exemptions are proportionate and legitimate. And there's been an awful lot of policy capture whereby organisations have spoken to NHS trusts or to schools or to other organisations, including refuges, and said to them that they do not have a proportionate and legitimate aim, even though they would do under the current law. So I think there needs to be much clearer guidance on the Equality Act itself. There needs to be much stronger definitions within the Equality Act of gender reassignment, which is different, remember, in terms of the um, definitions in that piece of legislation to the definitions in terms of a gender recognition certificate. I, I think that it comes to a crucial point that there is a need to look at the GRA. It is a piece of legislation from 16 years ago that was there to, up, to uphold our um, European Convention on Human Rights obligations. Um, one of the reasons so many European countries had in, enacted legislation before us is that it took us many years to create the Human Rights Act and to actually incorporate those um, laws into our domestic laws and to be bound by the European Convention at a domestic level. 
But the Gender Recognition Act is no longer um, necessary in terms of same-sex marriage, in terms of pension equality. And, and I'm sympathetic to the view that um, we should be looking at this. We don't necessarily need primary legislation when we're looking at this. We should be looking at trans healthcare. We should be looking at birth certificates that, um, or identity affirmation that allow people to marry or be buried in line with the, um, with the gender identity that they hold. Um, but when looking at that, I think that's got to be separate to looking at the Equality Act. Um, and I, I think that the government and, and the, law, the lawmakers and also the judges have really avoided this question. And that's what's created this huge toxic and polarised discussion amongst campaigners, amongst activists, amongst academics, because of the gap that's been left by the failure to take this on and address it head on. Thank you, Rosa. Does anybody else want to come in on that, Cathy? Yeah. Uh, yes, um, I would just like to add as well that um, I think although um, I heard Professor Sharp talking about two streams and um, it may be that when you drill down into the legal relationship between the two according to some um, academic view of them they don't relate but I think in, in, in the ordinary person's world they seem to relate because you have a person who has um, a birth certificate potentially that they could produce and they certainly now say I am legally a woman or I am legally a man um, the GRA concentrates an awful lot on privacy and it goes out of its way to specify some circumstances in which um, acquired gender may not be the um, presumptive most important thing. For instance, hereditary peerages, uh, sport um, and some sexual offences, but it doesn't mention um, spaces and so it's normal that people will assume that if somebody has a GRC that they will be entitled to access all the spaces resources um, and groups that uh, someone of the opposite sex would and this is not um, a situation that has been helped by the government um, following the last uh, trans inquiry in um, in saying that the very highest bar would have to be set before the legal, the same sex single sex exemptions could be operated so that that came from the government there's a persistent kind of um, impression given by even the H EHRC, who is also a Stonewall Diversity Champion, that you know you have to. It's really highly unusual that you should be allowed as an organisation to invoke these exemptions. Whereas in my view, it should be absolutely commonplace because there are so many situations where sex is going to make a difference, particularly where women are undressing or sleeping or in prison or in a hostel or in a refuge. So um, I think that there's absolutely a need for clarity here on what the relationship is. Thank you, Kathleen. Alice, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I thought there was a really interesting um, a potential contradiction between what Alex Sharp said when she said um, that there'd be uh, no change because the sex-based exemptions would still exist. And then one of the other panelists, I think it was Stephen Whittle said, it was important to re replace the language of sex with gender identity. Now these are two distinct things and it makes a huge difference. Um, let me give you a concrete example. So tomorrow the Scottish Parliament will be voting on whether the law in Scotland should allow rape victims to specify the sex of the person who conducts a forensic examination or the gender um, which the Scottish Government have admitted are not the same thing. Um, so there's a fundamental rights conflict there between the right of women to say that they only want that intimate examination in that particularly painful circumstances to be a female um, and the desire of someone who may have been born male to be considered as a woman in that context. Now, whatever you think the answer to that rights conflict is, we've got to actually acknowledge there's a rights conflict and have a grown-up conversation about it. Thank you, and that, that does lead on to um, nicely to my next question. So what, um, Rosa, if I come to you first, is that all right? What is your understanding of how confident those who operate single-sex spaces like women only support services feel in applying the Equality Act exemptions? I think it's very difficult. We're talking often about very underfunded organisations, uh, particularly if we're talking about women's refuges. This is a very underfunded um, sector. And if an, if, um, if an organisation, a lobby group, campaigners come to you and say, we will offer you free legal advice and help you to be compliant with the Equality Act or with any other piece of legislation, or come to you and say, 
you are not going to be compliant and we're going to try and take you to court. You can understand why these cash-strapped and resource-strapped refuges might be, have had policy capture by those organisations. There are very few who are, who are clear that they are um, applying the Equality Act and single-sex exemptions in line with the law. There are many who are terrified to speak out. And so even though they know what the Equality Act and single-sex exemptions are, they are worried that they won't get funding in, whether it's government funding, whether it's from private um, donors, whether it's from trusts, so charitable trusts. Um, and part of that is because if they have accusations levelled at them that they're transphobic, um, given that there's so little funding in the sector, um, funders are more likely to give to someone else. Um, so, and I, so I think it's very difficult to get a map of whether an organisation does know the law or whether it actually feels comfortable saying that it knows the law because they're two key different issues. Thank you, Rosa. Is there anybody that would like to add to that? I would, just, I would just like to add that I think we don't yet have a true picture of service users' experiences um, and that we really need one. So we're often told um, via kind of uh, trans activist organisations that there's no problem here and um, in fact I think I believe it was a submission to the last trans inquiry um, from I think it was James Morton who said something like um, we should just educate service users into feeling more comfortable um, with a trans person and in a rape crisis centre or a domestic violence refuge. But um, rather than take that paternalistic sort of line, I think we should find out whether this is making a difference to women. Are, is, it, is it in fact stopping them from self-referring to rape crisis centres? Or um, we could also take this conversation into the healthcare aid realm. Are they avoiding going for breast examinations? Uh, you know, so I think we need some proper non-politicised data from academics about what service users um, feel in relation to this, particularly when they've been traumatised. Um, if you're a rape victim, quite often you can be re-traumatised through inadvertent exposure to certain sights and sounds and smells. Um, it's not a matter of a, it's not a rational process traumatisation, and PTSD doesn't just you know respond to being told that you should educate yourself. So I think we really need to take put those people front and centre, their experience and what is best for them. And, and listen to their experiences, get some sense of what they are. Thank you. Can I just ask that um, answers are kept a little bit shorter because there's, there's quite a lot to get through. Um, so written evidence, Kathleen, if I come to you, written evidence to this inquiry suggests that many trans people feel that the current system of gender recognition infringes upon trans persons' human rights self-declare. How can the government best support the human rights of trans people and the human rights of women? Well, here I have a difference with um, the previous um, witnesses in that I'm afraid I don't think it's a human right to, um, self to have your identity recognised by the state uh, on its own. I think you have um, rights to be protected against discrimination and harassment for being trans, and I think that gender reassignment should continue to be a protected characteristic in the Equality Act. Um, but I don't see that there's anything infringing your rights um, by, I think, put it this way, I think that the idea that self-identification is a human right is based on the idea of gender identity being a permanent and innate um, thing, whereas by the witness's own evidence in the last session it isn't, it's often fluid, temporary, and um, certainly there's no evidence to suggest it's innate, it's, it's produced by context, um, environmental context. So. Um, I don't think that there's a particular right there. I think we need to really protect the rights of trans people um, in relation to discrimination and violence and harassment, and also think about women. Thank you, Kathleen Rosa. Can I bring you quickly in? Is that all right? Um, what the previous um, panellists were referring to, uh, they, they call it the right to self-determine. There is no human right to self-determine. There is a right of peoples to self-determine, which is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and was aimed at colonialism. It was a right of peoples to choose who would govern over them and to have permanency and over their natural resources. Now, I don't have an individual right to choose who governs over me, and nor do you. We have the right as a people, right? It's a collective right. The change in this language, um, Maybe, maybe just because people misunderstood it, or it might be disingenuous, but there is no human right to self-determine. There is only a right of peoples to self-determine. Thank you, Rosa. And my next, Alice, really briefly, 
Yeah, I just wanted to flag that there is a diversity of trans voices on this, and, and gen the gender identity lobby doesn't represent all trans people and doesn't represent, um, for example, a lot of detransition voices. So I just hope that you'll hear from some of those voices. Thank you. Um, and Rosa, just coming back to you in an article you wrote in 2018 on what would changes to the GRA mean? You argue self-identification may conflict with the rights of other vulnerable groups, particularly women and members of religious groups. Can you just expand on that, please? Um, so if we think about the single sex exemptions, um, that's, that's recognising that there might be a conflict of rights. And I think um, we also need to think about religious groups. There are religious groups and religion is a, is a protected characteristic. Religious groups who do have sex segregated spaces because it's proportionate or legitimate to do so, or may even have sex based roles, um, whether it's in terms of um, spiritual leaders or roles within a, within a church or a synagogue or a mosque. I was also particularly thinking about the rights of um, females and males um, who won't get changed in front of people of the opposite sex. Um, I was thinking in particular around Hampstead Ponds and the fact that the ladies' pond um, has typically been used by religious groups who won't swim in mixed sex spaces. But self-ID would turn those spaces into mixed sex spaces because it would, it would have allowed um, gen people to um, to identify their gender and then come into those spaces. Thank you. Um, and that's it from me, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Can I bring Angela Crawley in with, who had some supplementary questions, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to come in because we've touched across quite a lot of the sensitivities around this discussion, and I appreciate points that have been made by the panel about being in any sense, in any way, articulating a point that may then be construed as transphobic. Obviously, this to be has come quite polarised. I think it's fair to say a very emotional, quite um, perhaps emotive for people. There is obviously a paradox to that that there is an implication that someone would obtain either a gender recognition certificate or, for example, self ID under the proposals and that they would abuse that privilege or such or that legal, that legal recognition to act in a predatory manner or a violent manner. How would you reconcile this kind of disparity that implies essentially that perhaps someone could pick that up wrong and imply that all trans people are potentially violent or dangerous or predatory? Because I think we need to try and desensitise or rather take some of the tension out of this debate and address those concerns. Um, the, can I go? Um, I think the important thing that really needs to be get, got across in discussing is that this is about male patterns. If, if we're talking about the, the worry about violence and sexual assault, right? um, women are much more likely than um, men to be sexually assaulted, and where they are sexually assaulted, in 90% plus of cases, it is males that do so. And we're not just talking about rape, we're talking about um, other kinds of sexual assault, voyeurism, flashing, uh, upskirting, taking revenge porn. You know, there's a range of things here that can happen where women undress and, speak and sleep in public spaces. And the worry, you know, up until now, it has been uncontroversial that we exclude all males, including all the innocent ones and the majority of you know, reasonable people on the basis that we want to also exclude a few malfeasant people. And that has been perfectly well understood that it was never a character reference. It was never supposed to say that all males were bad because they clearly aren't. Exactly the same logic applies with self-ID and, and the, the sort of that spaces, exactly. But so in other words, it's, it's you excluding the many innocents in order to focus on a few. But there's no reason to think that once you self-ID as a woman, you become you know, less subject to the statistical generalizations that apply to the male sex. Having said that, I would just add that in the last trans inquiry, you should look again at the evidence submitted by the British Ident um, Association of Gender Specialists, or I, I can check that and send you it, and by the British Psychological Society, who are you know, very trans-friendly organisations but say of course there are circumstances where people will um, identify in order to 
to for malfeasance purposes. Of course there are, it's human nature. So we, we're not saying, of course that's not all trans people, but equally it's very strange to rule that out a priori. It's completely strange. Thank you, Kathleen. I think my point was more to address that kind of dangerous narrative that obviously implies that trans people are potentially all dangerous or potentially yeah, predatory. Absolutely. And I think to take from the pain out of that discussion, um, Rosa and Alice, you both had your hands up, so can I bring in Alice first and then I'll come to you, Rosa? Yeah, I just wanted very briefly to say that the reason that women value single-sex spaces isn't only about um, the fear of being assaulted. I mean, I want a single-sex changing room, mainly for privacy and dignity, and not because I, I, that I think a mixed changing room would necessarily um, uh, lead to a fear of violence. Um, similarly, you know, when a woman asks for um, a female to do a cervical smear test, it's not that she thinks a male doctor would attack her, it's about, it's about the dignity of that woman. And I think we accept that women have a right to ask for those things. Okay, thank you. Rosa? I think it's really important that we recognise that, that many trans individuals are vulnerable, right? Because we are all under patriarchal structures, and it is patriarchal structures make women vulnerable, make trans individuals vulnerable, make homosexuals vulnerable and so on. But um, what I heard in the last, um, the last panel was Professor Sharp completely dismissing out of hand women's fears and women's concerns around violence and dismissing out of hand the cases where, and they are cases from many countries, not just from the UK, where men have used the self-ID regimes of those countries in order to access women's spaces, particularly prisons, in order to rape them. One rape is too many, and I don't think we should ever dismiss out of hand those concerns. That's not to say that all men, as Kathleen said, are predatory, and certainly not all trans individuals are. But, but we have to have laws in place that protect the most vulnerable, and we have to recognise women's vulnerability. Okay, can I just ask Rosa one last question then? Because I think you rightly identified that the GRE does need to be updated, and I think you indicated earlier the disparities between language, both in the Gender Recognition Act, which we would all agree is outdated, and the Equality Act exemptions, and whether the language of those two provides sufficient legal protections for both trans people and for women. Um, so I wanted to ask specifically, kind of what exactly, if not the less medicalised approach, if not self ID, what are the kind of consensus of women's views around what what they feel would would perhaps alleviate the fears and concerns but would also redress some of these inequalities that are faced by trans but the, start, the starting point is to go to the initial consultation that led to the self-id proposal from the government and if you look down it the main concern is around healthcare. and if i'm taking a human rights lens trans individuals are not having their health care needs met by this country. There's not simply not enough, and you heard it from the last panel, from start to finish, even someone like Professor Whittle, who has a GRC, is not having his health care needs met by the current system. We need more money and more funding into it, and I, would, and, and I would say currently that we are violating the right to health of trans individuals in this country. Um, I think that the, the self-ID regime um, only works if we have proper definitions and only works if we have um, proper legislation. But I think that there are other ways of doing this. We don't need primary legislation. We could have identity affirmation or birth certificates that allow people to marry, to be buried, to do the things that affect them individually. Um, we should make these much more easily accessible. Um, I, I think it was very clear from the previous panel that, you know, the, the lack of transparency of the gender recognition panel needs to be addressed and all of those issue areas. What we need to work out is how that identity affirmation or birth certificates then works where it affects others. Um, we need better service provision for trans individuals, for those that want to have mixed gender identity service, but also we need to find ways to protect sex segregation. And we can only do that with a grown-up conversation. And for three years, I've um, watched many of these um, academics and activists refuse to engage in that conversation, refuse to discuss with us, um, refuse to sit on panels with those with opposite views. So how are we going to come up with the way of resolving conflicts of rights if we can't even talk? No further questions from me. Thank you. You. The next set of questions are from Kate Osborne, please. Thank you, Chair, and uh, hello uh, to everyone on the on the panel. Um, can I ask you first of all, what is your view on the government's response to the GRA consultation, and why do you think the government decided against 
self-identification. I mean, you've touched on the issues that you see with it, but if you have any insight as to why you think the government decided against it. Um, and if I could start with Rosa, please. I think that the, it's pretty clear that the government thought that self-ID would be the same easy win that same-sex marriage was, right? And same-sex marriage was an easy win because love is love and anyone should marry whoever they want to, so long as that person consents. What the government hadn't foreseen was the, um, the vast numbers of concerns from different groups, women's groups, religious groups, all sorts of groups, um, sports groups, uh, data statisticians, around self-ID. I don't think that they had thought it through properly. Now, the statistics of how many people responded to that consultation, when you think it had about 20 odd um, questions with free text boxes, and I don't envy the person that had to sit down and go through that data, but m many of them, um, many of the respondents were simply given the forms, filled out and told how to fill this out which skews the data. We saw it with the uh, National Union of Students, we saw it with um, other activist and campaign groups, telling their constituents how to fill it out and giving them a pre-filled out, essentially, here's a copy and paste. So whoever has to analyze that data at some point, if anyone does, um, will also have to work out how many of those responses were genuine responses from individuals writing their thoughts out, and how many were using the system, gaming the system, um, to flood it in the hope that that would skew the data. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kathleen, <clears throat> excuse me. I will come to you afterwards, Alice. Thank you. Um, I agree with Rosa that the um, government did not understand what it was doing, mainly because it had been only listening to a very narrow um, section of opinion um, which was telling them that it was all fine and this is what everybody wanted and there'd be no uh, consequences for anybody else. And then through... Um, the dogged persistence of uh, grassroots feminist groups like Women's Place, Fair Play for Women, Transgender Trend, uh, the LGB Alliance, um, these issues were forced into the light with no particularly great funding either. So I think it's a real testament to them, but it was basically the exposure of a kind of narrow ideological position into the light and that, and, and the government cannot ignore the very obvious um, concerns that there are around allowing people to self-ID from one sector to the next. Thank you. And Alice? Yeah, I think, you know, we live in a democracy and the government was probably mindful of public opinion, which is quite appropriate. Um, so recent YouGov polling shows, for example, people are very supportive of trans people and their um, their right to live as they wish, but only 16% of people think that changing legal gender should be possible without a doctor's approval. And people's responses to questions about um, trans people and, and what services they should access and so on, um, that change quite a bit once it's explained to them that um, a trans woman, for example, might have had no genital surgery, no medical intervention. Once that's explained, then most people don't think that trans women should be allowed into women's sports and women's changing rooms. So I think there's a question about the definition of terms and actually getting everybody to be having a conversation uh, where we know what we're talking about, because I think people have huge sympathy with the very small number of fully transitioned transsexuals that uh, the original GRA legislation would have been about and absolutely respect everybody's right to live their lives as they wish, but don't necessarily see why there should be a legal status for a personal identity um, which doesn't change your body, given that that conflicts with women's right to privacy. Thank you. So, uh, um, bearing in mind your, your, your responses there, in written evidence, some trans people have said that they felt that the Government Equalities Office were more prepared to listen to the views of women's groups during the consultation. Can I ask you for your response to that? Would you agree uh, or not and why? And I'll go back to Rosa first, thank you. Um, I think for many years, um, the, the trans lobby groups and trans activists um, have captured the ears, whether it was of um, policymakers, whether it's of smaller institutions, and, and, and also of parts of the media. I think women's groups, and particularly as Kathleen said, um, Women's Place UK, which sprang up um, in order to help women to organise at the grassroots level and to be able to voice their concerns, found it very difficult to be able to talk to these policymakers. And it's only through their sheer hard work and determination and the, and, and the fact that these are left-wing trade union women who know how to organise that they even were 
able to speak to the government. I do take on board what, um, what, what some trans individuals and some trans allies say, which are parts of the media will only listen to women's concerns and parts of the media will only listen to trans concerns. And, and I think that um, there needs to be far better um, coverage, certainly by the BBC, far better coverage of both sides. And currently the BBC is very much captured by the sort of trans voices. That's not to say that there are, you know, the Murdoch press has, has ever given any, um, any time to trans voices. And I think we need to be open and, and honest and upfront about this, that the media plays a strong role in how they're portraying this type of capture. But if you look at the amount of organizations that have gone in to speak to the government, it's by far skewed towards um, the trans organizations or organizations supporting trans rather than the women's grassroots organizations. Thank you, and Kathleen? Uh, I think if you look back to 2015, that Stonewall published a vision for change, this document that then was pretty much um, set out its agenda, including self-ID and various other things that have been on the agenda of the government up until recently. So it may seem as if, um, seem to some people as if the government is listening um, disproportionately to women's voices, but it really is the first time in since in recent years since um, that they've been heard at all. So I think it, there's maybe been an overcorrection in some areas, but as Rosa says, in other areas, we still can't get through. We can't get a fair hearing in places where we would naturally feel at home, like The Guardian or the BBC. So, um, you know, I think it's patchy and you can't tell, Rosa's point is well taken, you can't tell a single story, but um, I don't recognise the phenomenon that you've described, no. Okay, thank you. And Alice? Yeah, I really want to thank this committee for listening to Women's Voices, because I think um, this is something that hasn't happened up till now. And in fact, those lobbying for self-ID have had far more access to GEO ministers than, than organisations um, lobbying for women's rights. Um, so records requested um, via Freedom of Information show that Liz Truss had three meetings with pro self ID organisations and individuals between taking up her role and announcing her decision on GRA reform, whereas she did not meet with any of those urging caution, including women's organisations such as WP UK and Fair Play for Women. Thank you. And um, that's a, a good point uh, leading into my next question. So I'll, I'll go back to you first on this one, Alice, if I can. Um, so what else, if anything, should the government have included in its proposals? So, I mean, uh, coming at this from a data collection point of view, I would have really liked to have seen clear guidance on data collection and equalities monitoring. Um, this is one of the areas where I think there's been muddle because people are confused between sex and gender identity. And we need to make a clear distinction between the two and say they're both important and we need um, data on both. So I would have liked to see the government recognize the legitimacy and importance of collecting and analyzing data based on sex. Um, and um, in particular, um, I would have liked them to say that publicly funded or mandated data such as the census or equal pay monitoring should always include a natal sex variable. And of course, we can also um, collect data on gender identity alongside that. Thank you. Kathleen? Um, I would like some explicit uh, consideration of um, spouses. Um, and I hope that this committee will hear from uh, the spouses or ex-spouses of transition people from a range of perspectives. But I think in the emphasis of the committee, uh, sorry, of, of the government rather, on kindness, um, that's fine but and good, but kindness obviously needs to be applied across the board and not just towards one group. And I think that um, we don't hear enough from spouses and it would be good to keep them in focus as well. Thank you. And Rosa, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think picking up on Kathleen's point, um, we have to recognise marriage as a contract. And if someone unilaterally unilaterally changes the terms of that contract, the contract would normally be void. And I, I think it's really important that we hear spousal voices. Um, I think that I think that the the key thing for me is around gender dysphoria. I, I take on board the point that the World Health Organization has said that um, transgenderism should not be uh, medicalized anymore, seen as a medical um, condition. But if people don't have gender dysphoria, then I think that we need some very explicit guidance on the basis at which they access free NHS healthcare if it's not a medical condition. 
And this really needs to be worked out because it's all well and good to say we don't want to call it a medical condition. But then how does that impact trans healthcare, which is a key issue that I that I keep um, coming back to. OK, thank you very much. Um, so my next question is, um, in, in the written evidence received by this committee, many people have argued that the nearly two year gap between the government opening the consultation and responding to the consultation has resulted in misinformation and harm. Would you agree with that? And if so, if you could tell me why or tell us why. Um, Rosa, yep. I think actually that two year gap, the lead up and the lead up to the consultation and the consultation itself opened out these discussions within the general public. And as Alice says, you know, this is a democratic society and those discussions had to be had. Within that two year gap, and I, I accept that that gap is partly to do with Brexit and partly to do with the sheer volume of submissions that were received. Um, but within that time, this opened out more and more discussions for more and more people, um, including women's groups, but certainly not just limited to women's groups. I think that there has been a particular toxicity um, in online spaces. And I think that that has not been helped by the leadership from academics who are either trans um, themselves or are allies of trans individuals and advancing trans sort of activist positions to refuse to have grown up conversations with their counterparts. For me, um, I was on Women's, Hour, uh, on Women's Hour being interviewed alongside Alex Sharp. Alex Sharp is a professor of law and a barrister. Part of our jobs as lawyers is to discuss and debate and argue things in courtrooms or elsewhere. And I was very disappointed that Professor Sharp refused to have a conversation with me and wanted to be interviewed separately. But I think that that, that feeds into the toxicity of the debate and the demonization of those people who are trying to express different opinions based on robust evidence. Thank you. Kathleen? I think we heard a lot in the last session about Ireland, but I think it's also notable and what's come to light um, in the course of our public discussion in the UK is that um, uh, there's evidence that um, trans activist organisations have uh, deliberately tried to keep the discussion of gender recognition reform under the radar, talking directly to politicians, but keeping it out of the public eye. And that came out in a document that was published. Well, it's a, I'm thinking of an article in The Spectator by James Kirkup, but it talks about this document published by, I think it was Denton's uh, legal um, organisation, advising trans activist organisations about how best to get what they want. So I think that's profoundly anti-democratic and there isn't a, a massively uh, stunning um, history of women's rights in Ireland. So when we're confronted now with this, you know, Ireland as the place where everything's fine, I would really like to know, A, how many of ordinary citizens in Ireland knew what was happening when the law was changed and B, what effect has all that had on ordinary women, if indeed um, their daily lives have changed in relation to exposure to trans people in uh, changing rooms and so on. So I think we need more information there too. And we can't just assume because we've been told by trans activist organisations, everything's fine in these other countries, that it is. And I think to add to that, to add to that, we are always told that example of Malta. Malta, abortion is illegal. It's criminalised in Malta. Many of the countries that are cited around, um, look at these great self-ID regimes. First of all, the, the, the citation doesn't drill down into the detail about retaining sex-based exemptions. But as Kathleen says, certainly doesn't drill down into the detail around very shocking and very recent histories of women's rights. Okay, thank you, Alice. Um, yeah, I, I fully endorse what's been said about the two year gap actually being important in opening up debate and discussion. Um, I think it's true that there has been toxicity, but we've got to think about why that is. It's actually been driven by gender identity activists concertedly trying to shut um, people who disagree with them up. If I can give you one example, in the recent Labour Party leadership and deputy leadership elections, several candidates actually pledged to expel advocates from women's rights from the party. Now, I attended a solidarity rally to defend a Woman's Place UK and LGB Alliance um, in the wake of that in March this year, and the meeting was held near Grenfell Tower. Gender identity extremists actually attempted to intimidate women and frighten women attending that meeting by letting off smoke bombs to give the impression of a fire and bearing in mind the location that was horrifying. Um, and I can testify to how 
frightening and intimidating the behaviour of those activists was. Um, in contrast, I am not aware of a single attempt to stop gender identity activists from meeting um, or to disrupt their events or activities. So there is toxicity, but it's very much um, driven in one direction by an, an attempt to shut down a normal conversation. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, my final question is, um, what steps do you think the government should have taken to mitigate the harm that's clearly been caused as a result of opening this consultation? Can I just um, sort of question the premise of that? We live in a democracy and debate and consultation are not harmful. So we, we hear a lot of hyperbolic language about this calling debate um, literal violence and so on. Well, conversation is really important in a democracy. We need conversation, it's not harmful. Um, I think in terms of what the government could do, I think we need politicians across the political spectrum to actually stand up for women's civil liberties. So for example, when a woman MP like Rosie Duffield is monstered simply for suggesting we should be able to use the word woman rather than cervix haver, I think most people would find that absurd. Um, there's still time for parliamentarians, I think, to speak out and to try to help create a more normal environment in which people, women would feel less at risk speaking up. Thank you. I mean, what I would, what I would say is certainly by harm, there seems to be harm between trans groups and women's groups. So certainly within that context, uh, if I can put that question now to Rosa. I think, um... For, for many years, um, trans groups, um, LGB, homosexual groups and women's groups have found intersections in terms of fighting against patriarchal structures. And uh, but there are times when those groups have their own interests and there are other times when those interests might conflict. Um, and I think I think that's really important to, to flag here. For me, the government's um, uh, the government allowing Stonewall to monopolise these discussions without recognising that there are people, constituents of Stonewall, who oppose Stonewall's current position in terms of sex and gender identity. And the government allowing that monopoly to go ahead, not just within you know, government structures, but within academic institutions, schools, the NHS and so on, um, has been key to driving this, this toxic, harmful kind of divisions between these interest groups. And I think it's absolutely crucial that the government opens up space for other grassroots activist organizations to come in and advise them, to come in and be consulted with, and also to have access to funding. Thank you. And finally, Kathleen. And I couldn't agree more with that. It just absolutely has to be recognized that um, Stonewall and gendered intelligence do not speak for all trans people and I get emails all the time from transsexuals and trans people who say this is nothing to do with me. I do not recognise this conception of rights or gender identity or what we want in relation to women's spaces. I feel now that this whole toxicity is now putting me newly at risk in a way that I wasn't before. Um, so there's just this kind of um, assumption that Stonewall must have their ear straight tap mainlined in to somehow the hive mind of trans people. And of course, trans people aren't a hive mind. They're like, they have a range of political views. Uh, they have a range of all sorts of different things. So um, a better consultation that starts from a neutral standpoint, that doesn't come in with a sort of heavily rhetorical kind of manipulative language, but just really does seek to fact find from a range of voices about what's going on without taking any one person as standing for a group. So of course we're not speaking for all women. I would never pretend to speak for all women. And I can't tell you about the women's community or the gay women's community as I am a gay woman, because there's a range of voices there and you need to hear from all of them. That's what the democratic process requires. Okay, can I thank you all, Chair? Thank you very much. Uh, Belle Ribeiro Addy has our last section of questions. I'm conscious that we only have 10 minutes left and I've got several members want to come in with some supplementary, so please can the answers be succinct. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, my questions are for Rosa and, and, and Kathleen. Uh, in light of the government's response to the consultation um, on the GRA, what do you think the solution is to making the GRA work better for trans people whilst addressing some of the concerns that have been raised 
um, by, by women and, and about single sex spaces. And do you know any examples of, of gender recognition legislation in, in other countries, perhaps, um, that, are, that are widely supported by trans people whilst also, also mitigating those, those concerns? I think that we have to listen to trans voices as to how the gender recognition process would work better for them. And I listened to the voices on the panel earlier, but I've listened to voices over the last three years and it, it needs to be cheaper. It needs to be more accessible. It needs to have uh, more transparency and, um, and, and it needs to work. You know, I, I think that it's not just about gaining a gender recognition certificate. I, it, it, it's distressing to hear um, about Professor Whittle struggling to access a healthcare that um, that a natal born man would access easily. And it's um, disturbing to hear about people having to go through such um, undignified processes in order to be able to avoid um, the embarrassment of their wedding day being married in, in, in the sex that they don't present as. Um, in terms of how that legislation then works for women's rights, that I can talk to. Um, most of the countries where, um, where there is some form of identity affirmation or self-declaration also have robust laws in place around sex-based exemptions. We've got the laws in the Equality Act. We need to define those laws and we need to define the circumstances in which those laws do or don't apply for those with or without a gender recognition certificate. There is no avoiding this. We need to define what gender identity is. We need to define it legally and from a policy point of view, and we need to explain how the law works for different sets of situations. They need to be written down and agreed upon and enshrined, and then organisations will be able to apply them. That is what happens in some of the other countries um, to which uh, panelists have referenced. It's really important, though, to note that countries like Denmark have had similar problems to Ireland in terms of self-ID, in terms of the predatory males, not the, not the general trans population, but the predatory males using those systems in order to access women's spaces and particularly rapes in prisons. But I think that there is no way for the government and the judiciary and the lawmakers to avoid the fact that the ball is in your court to actually define how the law works before putting in an identity affirmation regime. Um, I would just add to that to the first part that um, I'm told that 41% um, of applicants for gender recognition certificates are now under the age of 29 and that's a big change. Um, so I think it's very important that they get the right health care, including, and I think we should also consider this, you should consider this, in light of the fact that CAMS, Children and um, Adolescent Mental Health Services, are chronically underfunded. So there needs to be um, full mental health provision for younger people contemplating a life-changing change and it is it is a life-changing change for many of them because for many of them it will involve taking medication or having surgery that they might later come to regret so i think there should be full attention on the health care of trans people that seems perfectly reasonable and the other thing i don't uh, with respect to single sex spaces what i really never have understood is why trans activist organizations couldn't go for third spaces, we couldn't. Why couldn't they put their considerable um, power behind um, the case for, you know, third spaces in addition to single sex spaces? And um, so that would be something that I think should be properly explored, rather than this constant either or. We've either got um, trans women in men's spaces, or we've got them in women's spaces. Well, look, there are other ways to do this. Thank you. Um and the next question is to Kathleen. In your in your article, can you change your gender? In relation to the word gender, you stated that over history, the word has come to be used in relatively many senses, each referring to different things. This is part of the reason arguments are often so toxic. Um, could you expand on, on what you meant by this? Yes, absolutely. So gender is one of the most ambiguous words I can possibly think of. Sometimes it's just used as a polite euphemism for biological sex, as when traditionally a passport um, application would ask you what your gender was, male or female. Um, sometimes it's used uh, to cover masculinity and femininity, so the social meanings or stereotypes around biological sex. Sometimes by um, some academics, it's used to mean something like womanhood or manhood that's assumed to be different from being male or female, but that's not a widely understood um, meaning. And then now we have gender identity, which is a psychological, purely psychological identification with an ideal of the opposite sex or with androgyny. And then in the 
Gender Recognition Act, we've got acquired gender, <laughs> where it's really not clear, clear to me what an acquired gender is, whether it's an acquired sex. or. But I think the best way to understand it is a kind of fiction that somebody has changed sex, because um, in my considered view, it is impossible to actually change sex, so it must, it could only be an acquired, uh, uh, sorry, it could only be a fiction. So yes, there's, so it's multiply ambiguous, and sometimes you find people um, arguing about things you think, well, if you could only explain your terms or define your terms, you'd find you, you agreed with each other, but you're arguing actually about two different things. Thank you. Um, and, and just finally, to, to both Kathleen and Rosa again, uh, the, do, do you think there needs to be a legal definition for uh, gender in our legislation? Uh, last year, uh, the ONS and the UK government defined gender in, in a particular uh, way you may be aware of it but do you think there needs to be a legal definition for gender uh, and if so why and i think i'll ask, I'll ask rosa first i think um actually i'm, I'm going to change the question slightly i think we need legal definitions for gender identity transgender gender reassignment right that might in involve having a legal definition for gender but i want to make it clear no one has these legal definitions even at the un level um, the legal definition just involves the same umbrella um, of, of various different groups. And we, and we heard from the last panel, and when we listen to trans voices, those groups are very different to one another. You know, trans, trans women and trans men have very different um, um, sort of needs and interests, as do non-binary individuals and gender fluid and everyone else that comes within this stonewall definition that's been adopted at the UN level and at other levels. If we look at other countries, we often get circular definition so your gender identity is the gender that you identify as that doesn't help us um, and um, we need these definitions and we need to consult with trans groups to to understand what these legal defi definitions are and how they will be most useful for trans groups but we also need to consult with women's groups around how those definitions work in terms of the definition that we have in law currently for sex which does date back to you know 1970 or so um, but the definition that we have in law is around biology um, and if and if that definition is to be changed it should be changed through legal and democratic processes not through kind of stealth um, trying to replace the word sex with gender or gender identity in lots of policies thank you and um, kathleen yes Just to interrupt um, a moment please and i'm really sorry to do this but um i have to leave i said we had to have a, a, a hard stop at 4 30 but i'm going to put the vice chairman angela in the chair who will conclude the formal bits of the meeting but there's a number of members wanted to ask supplementary questions and that will allow them to do so and just the meeting to run over for a few minutes so i hope the witnesses are happy with that and angela can i hand over to you please okay thank you um can i first of all bring in Ellie? Hey. Angela. So, uh, shall we bring? Sorry, I, th th I think we've lost Angela. Sorry. sorry, apologies. I am still here. So we've lost Angela. I think. Am I allowed to put any other member, or does it have no, to be Angela? No, I'm here. Oh, Angela's back. So I think Bell had some more yeah. questions um, to conclude as uh, well. I think but Kathleen, sorry. Kathleen was just answering the last question from me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I'll be as quick as I can. But um, of course, if you're making legislation, you need to define your terms. And I'll just give you a quick example of the confusion that can arise. So um, the Gender Recognition Act talks about acquired gender, but in the notes that I was looking at yesterday, um, it says that if you've got a GRC, you will be protected under the protected characteristic of sex. Um, the Equality Act talks about gender reassignment, but it also talks about changing sex. So there's, there's huge confusion around this area already, and I think they need to be redrafted to make it clearer. Thank you very much. And um, that's all from me, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, can I now bring in Nicola, who wanted to ask a supplementary? Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to go back to something you said, Rosa, about um, predatory males and um, how the same stats carry over from males to trans women um, in terms of um, statistics of um, abuse on women. Do you have any statistics that you can give us to prove that? You're on mute, Rosa. So there are statistics from a Swedish study, uh, which I can send to you um, after the 
after the session, if that's helpful. Um, they were written up in, a, in academic journals and things like that. So they're robust data, as Alice would say. So just because a couple of times you've mentioned this and about how there's hard facts um, that prove that this is the case. And just so far throughout the whole session, you haven't given us any stats to, to prove that. Well, that's that's because I'm I'm citing a I'm citing a Swedish study, but I I try to avoid being too academic when I'm in these kind of sessions. But I'm very happy to provide you with the citations afterwards. It's a well-known Swedish study um, on offending rates and um, and and male male-born people, whether they are men or trans women. Uh, but I'm I'm happy to send that over to you, or even if there's a Zoom chat in here, I can happily ping it into the chat if that's helpful. Can I just add to that that um, I'm aware of that study too, and it is it's certainly um, good evidence, but it only refers to people who have had, as I recall, um, medical and hormonal intervention. So what we lack is evidence about self ID. Um, no one's ever looked at that evidence, as far as I can see. But I certainly don't accept that we can't. We we should somehow the the lack of that evidence should. Um, should mean that that we go ahead with this because it, it, we have to be cautious we have i mean there's going to be if we're right there's going to be a big impact on women's lives so i think it's academics need to go and look for that evidence and at the moment we're not in a situation where that kind of um investigation can happen uh, neutrally because of the politicization of the academic sphere but it would be a very good idea if we could have access to that evidence but we shouldn't assume because we don't have it that then everything must be fine that would be crazy and actually, it's, it's, it's the opposite way around to how we would normally act. Normally, if you want to make changes, you have to provide the evidence to show that those changes are safe or why those changes are needed, that you have to provide the data, the robust evidence and so on. This almost seems a little bit Kafkaesque that women are being asked to provide the data, and, and there are studies out there, but to, to show why things must stay the same. We have a long history in society of why we have sex segregated spaces, whether that's women's access to political participation, women's access to public life, women's access to swimming. That's why Hampstead Ladies Pond was built, because it was, you know, women weren't allowed to swim in, in mixed sex spaces or in the seaside. Um, women's access to sports, all of these, there's a long history for it, um, and there is all sorts of evidence as to why we need sex based sex segregated spaces if there is to be gender identity segregated spaces then those who are advocating for it need to bring the robust data to show why it won't impact on women would you accept however that to make the assumption that you know that these are predatory males and predatory trans women um that 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 has a quite a damaging effect without robust data as you've um you, you pointed to without the stats the, I, think, I think you've misunderstood. I didn't say, I said most trans individuals are not predatory, but there will be predatory males. We have the data, we have the rapes in prisons, not in, just in this country, but in Ireland, in Denmark and elsewhere. We know that there are predatory males and you're pushing me on this. And I've told you that there is data and a Swedish study. So now it feels like you're accusing me of lying. No, it's okay, just this is a select committee. It would be helpful to have had those statistics, but uh, we'll, we'll look we'll look out for those. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Perhaps I could come in at this point and suggest, Rosa, if you have any articles that you think would be helpful to the committee, you could submit them after the committee. Um, we'll bring in Peter at this point. Thank you, Chair. And could I just return to Alice in respect of uh, part of her earlier evidence in regards to the consultations that Liz Trust, the Equalities Minister, um, took into account uh, in advance of the announcements? Um, the implication from your comment was that women's groups were disadvantaged or ignored as opposed to the uh, trans lobby for, for want of a better expression. Is it is it your view that the trans lobby was advantaged in Liz Truss's announcements as a result of that? Uh so I, I wouldn't talk about the trans lobby, I would talk about the gender identity lobby because I think trans people have a range of views. I think what the freedom of information request shows very clearly is that gender identity groups like Stonewall have very good access to government. Um, so they have been listened to. Obviously, that does not imply that they got what they wanted because being listened to and getting what you want are two different things. Um, so no, I think, uh, I think they probably were disappointed by the results. And no, no advantage was given to them despite your protest that they were listened to a number of times more than others. 
They have an advantage in terms of access to government, but despite that, I don't think they got what they wanted on this occasion. However, I think with GRA reform, um, something quite interesting that's happened is that organisations have acted in advance of, the, of what they thought the legal change was going to be. And so um, there's a lot that's changed ahead of the law. So if we look at data collection, for example, um, we're losing data collection on sex because organisations think they have to collect data based on self-ID. So police forces are recording crimes by men as though they were committed by women at the request of the perpetrator. ACAS organisational pay gap data being collected according to gender identity rather than sex with the option to exclude non-binary um, employees from the data entirely. The replacement of actual sex with desired sex on medical records at patient request, which is harmful for research, but often also harmful for those individual trans patients in terms of their care. And government has actually issued guidance to government departments saying they must not use sex as a data category unless they genuinely cannot provide the service in question without this information. So what you've got is an ideology that says we can't talk about sex and we can't collect data on sex. And that's running through not just government but a range of organizations and that's what we've got to sort out but thank you for clarifying no, no advantage was given to them uh, one final question from me for each of the panelists could you each confirm for me your views to whether a trans woman is a woman and whether a trans man is a man please starting with you rose please well, I'll go down the, um, the law route because that's my expertise and I think you'd rather have my expertise than my personal opinion. Um, in law, it says that a man is uh, someone who's born male with biology in terms of chromosomes, gonads and genitalia, and a woman is someone who's born female with the same, with the same biolog biological factors. Now, there is the legal fiction where a trans woman or a trans man may gain a gender recognition certificate that changes their legal sex, but doesn't change their actual sex. So currently in law, a trans woman is a trans woman unless she holds a GRC, in which case she is a she is male, she is a trans woman, but legally she would be recognized as a woman for many, but not all purposes. Now, if that sounds complicated, it's because the law is currently in a bit of a mess and that's why we need to change it and to try and streamline this. But my opinion therefore changes depending on whether someone holds a GRC or not, but I stick in line with what the law currently says that your sex is determined by biology. Thank you. Kathleen? Um, I think that um, we have two sexes, males and females. We have the human versions, the human males and females, and we have the adult and the younger versions, adult human males and females and younger. And we need uh, a category to describe what the adult human male and the adult human female is because it aids communication about a vast range of things given that we are a sexually dimorphic species that reproduces via heterosexuality. So uh, in other words, I think woman is adult human female and, ma and man is adult human male. That's the best understanding of those categories. So I think I've been very clear. I think there's a distinction between sex and gender identity. Both of them are quite properly protected characteristics and we need to see them as distinct. Um, I think the slogan trans women are women has been actually really unhelpful. Um, grown up mature adults do not talk in slogans. We need to think about the fact that there might be contexts where we want to treat trans women as though they were women and trans men as though they were men and other contexts where that's not appropriate. For example, um, if we think about sporting um, categories or changing rooms or data collection, all sorts of different issues may come up and we need to have a sensible conversation about those different contexts. Thank you, Chair. Nothing further for me. Okay, and I have a final question from Sarah. I want to come back, Alice. We've spoken about the data quite a lot, um, and you argue that data providers should be encouraged to collect data on respondents' sex as a distinct from gender identity. Is it possible for that to be done in a way which doesn't undermine? Um, both the GRA and those who have obtained a gender recognition certificate. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because actually earlier this year the ONS um, raised this 
with me as a possible objection to asking for sex in the census. Um, I would say that you know when we collect data, um, privacy considerations are also always paramount. It's always anonymized. It's not about outing people. Um, so I was very pleased that um, uh, a recent legal opinion that's just come out in the last couple of days challenges what I was told by ONS. So apparently the EHRC has misrepresented the law according to a legal opinion um, by Aidan O'Neill QC. And if I may quote from that, he concluded that a mandatory question relative to what was your sex at birth will not constitute an unlawful intrusion into an individual's right to respect for their private life if the information is required by a public authority or a private body exercising public law functions in accordance with law and the information is properly necessary for the achievement of a legitimate aim. So in response to that, um, A Woman's Place have challenged EHRC to change their guidance in line with that. Thank you, Alice. I don't know whether anyone quickly wants to come in on that because I'm, I'm conscious of time, but if not, Chair, that's, that's it from me. Rosa, sorry. I, I think there's one issue that hasn't <coughs> arisen on either panel and I think relates to privacy, which is I find it deeply concerning and I hear some trans voices who, who've helped me to understand how deeply concerning it is that we have lists of trans people through the Gender Recognition Act and those who have a Gender Recognition Certificate. The idea of governments having lists of vulnerable groups doesn't sit particularly well with me in terms of my personal and religious Jewish history. And I think it doesn't sit very well with many individuals who are trans, um, for whom they have had to live in shadow throughout their lives. I think that's something that ought to be raised, um, where, where those lists actually do violate the right to private and family life and rights to privacy. I don't have an answer, but I do think it's, a, it's an important question and concern that I've heard from the trans community or parts of the trans community and I think needs to be addressed by the government. Thanks Rose, that's quite interesting. Uh, Chair, that's it from me. Okay, um, can I just say thank you to all the panellists um, for your contributions in this afternoon's discussion. I hope that you feel that your views have been heard in this forum and of course the inquiry onto, in this um, inquiry will obviously contribute to that discussion and we hope that we will all be able to improve transgender equality whilst also hearing the voices of the many